He has a, a handout, and uh, if not, they're at the front door. If you come in. Uh, are there any leftover questions from, from last week? We're talking about the intermediate state. Uh, this um, section this morning will, will actually bring us to the end of the intermediate state, that time between our death and, uh, and the resurrection, which is the intermediate state. We're going to be looking at the resurrection, which of course puts a final end to that, uh, but then brings about a, a new beginning in some sorts uh, for both. Um, but for the wicked, of course, not pleasant. For the righteous, um, uh, very pleasant. Okay, if there's no questions left over, then let's go ahead and look at the resurrection. The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 32, section 2. At the last day, such as are found alive shall not die, but be changed. And all the dead shall be raised up with the selfsame bodies and none other, although with different qualities, which shall be united again to their souls forever. So this basically, this, this section answers the questions, or the question, what will happen to the bodies, oh, excuse me, th this actually doesn't summarize uh, what we're looking at. It's not only what will happen to the bodies of the righteous, but what will happen to the bodies of the, uh, the wicked as well. Notice, um, uh, those that are found alive shall not die, but be changed. The dead shall be raised up. It doesn't really distinguish between the righteous and the unrighteous. So we're going to be looking at, um, at both. Let's see, the saints. Yeah, okay, but the unbelievers just a little bit at the end. Okay, so first of all, let's uh, talk about what will happen to the bodies of the righteous on the, um, the day of Christ's uh, return. Uh, first question is, when will the bodies of the righteous be raised? I think I've already answered that question. What, when will that happen? What's, what's the event that will bring that about? At the second coming. I, I misread my question and I actually included the answer in it. So uh, anyway, when Christ returns at the second coming, I don't think there's uh, any big question about that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so uh, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, why do you think Paul needed to write this, um, these particular ideas, this, this particular sentiment? Uh, this isn't probably obvious in this case, but uh, it, it appears as though Paul was addressing... Oh, you're going to go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Kathy. I think you were going to say this anyway, but somebody, there was a rumor going around that the Lord had already returned. Okay, well, let's see. Is that, um, that is uh, possible, but I, there is another possibility as well, and that is that uh, those that, uh, well, those that died, or those who believe that those who died before Jesus Christ's return actually will, would have perished, they would be gone. That seems to be... Um, uh, at least if you read it in the context, that seems to be what's going on there. That you, you basically had to survive to the coming of Christ in order to be uh, raised or to be saved or to be translated, but those who died have perished. But he says that we don't grieve as those who have no hope because we do believe that the Lord will bring those who have died with him when he does return. Okay, so there were misunderstandings in the church about what was going to take place and so forth, what, you know, whether or not those who died before Jesus returned would actually be saved or whether they had just perished altogether. But uh, Paul is telling them they ought to comfort one another with these words that, that those loved ones who have died, you shouldn't be grieving over them because they are with the Lord. And when he returns, they're actually going to precede us. They're going to be raised first before uh, the, the living saints are actually changed. So, so don't be uh, grieved, don't, don't be sorry about that. Uh, actually, uh, things are going to work out, uh, you might say, even better for them than they will be for you. Now, when is the next question? When will the second coming take place? <laughs> we don't know the day or the hour, but what do we know about it? When, do we, when, when will Jesus Christ return? What, what's the event that's going to trigger that? Greg? It can't happen until the last elect person has been saved. Okay. 
And that's essentially what, what the case is going to be. When the last elect person, uh, whether it be a Jew or a Gentile, we don't really know which it's going to be, uh, when that last elect, that last sheep for whom Jesus laid down his life is gathered in, at that particular time, then the Lord will return. Okay. Now, uh, I think we, um, we know that from, um, let's see, Okay, we know that if you look under B, when all the elect have been gathered in, I guess I, I skipped over one other place here. Excuse me, I'm a little bit tired today. I've been through a couple of long days. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. I believe that's the implication of what Paul is saying here. In Romans chapter 11, he is talking about the situation with the Jews. Um, has God's promise to Israel failed? Uh, the fact that they have rejected their Messiah uh, and he has turned to the Gentiles. He says, uh, no, that's not, that's not uh, what's taken place, but rather it's a part of God's plan to provoke the Jews to jealousy in order to get those who are his people uh, jealous of the fact that the Gentiles now have these blessings and provoke them to receive Jesus Christ so that they can receive the blessings as well. But then he goes on to talk about what will happen when the fullness of the Jews have come in, which at the same time, of course, the fullness of the Gentiles will have come in. Yeah, let me go ahead and read it for you. I say then, they, that is uh, the Jews or Israel, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous, that is the Jews. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their, their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? What he's saying there is their transgression, that is the Jews' rejection of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. If, if their rejection turns out to be riches for the world, or in other words, riches for the nations, for the Gentiles, because God turns from the Jews to the Gentiles in order to offer them those blessings that Israel rejected, he says how much more will their fulfillment be, that is if they actually do embrace the Messiah. If they reject the Messiah and it brings riches to the world, how much more when they receive their Messiah will it bring riches, as it were, to the world? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, or of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? but life from the dead. Now we could, we could say, it's possible that what Paul has in mind here is that he's saying that if the Jews receive their Messiah, that they will be spiritually resurrected, as it were, life from the dead. Or he could be saying that once, once he has gathered in, of course, or uh, when he turns back to Israel or, or when he, uh, as he gathers Israel in uh, through this process and they receive the Messiah and you've got the Actually, I think it was a little bit clearer. Let's turn to Romans chapter 11. I think I might have skipped just a little bit of, of what was in the, uh, the passage here. Um, the implication is that uh, God has partially hardened Israel and turned to the Gentiles. And he is gathering in his people from the Gentiles. And when he turns then uh, through that process, provokes Israel to receive the Messiah, and the, the full number comes in, and I think that's what the fulfillment there really has to do with. And again, I, think as, I guess I have already talked about the passage I need to look at. Uh, if, if then the, the fullness of the, uh, of, of the Jews receive their Messiah, I think what the, the idea here is that you've got the fullness of the Gentiles, you've got the fullness of the Jews. At that point, you're going to have uh, life from the dead or resurrection, not just for the Jews, uh, in the sense that they're spiritually resurrected, but rather um, uh, resurrection, bodily resurrection. Uh, I think um, I think we get that a little bit more. If you'll look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25, I think here's where we uh, here's where we get the two ideas put together. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And thus all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob, 
and this is the covenant, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the idea is that there's a hardening of Israel, he turns to the Gentiles, and that's to provoke Israel to jealousy. But there's going to come a time when uh, this partial hardening is finished with, with Israel. And that's going to be when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Notice in verse 25, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, when that takes place, it, it, I think it's implied here in Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? That acceptance seems to signal the ending of the uh, partial hardening. Okay, the, the partial hardening is lifted. Their, their full acceptance now has taken place. And that doesn't mean by, uh, you know, that, that all the Israelites necessarily are going to be saved. But uh, that means that the, the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. When the partial hardening is lifted from Israel, that means that all the elect Israelites will be gathered in. And when that takes place, uh, there will be life from the dead, which is in what's implied there is resurrection. Now we might, just by way of logic, imply that anyway. When God has gathered in all of his elect, and there's only two groups of people in the world as far as the Bible is concerned. There's the Jews and the Gentiles. Once God has gathered them all in, at some point the Lord has to return after that. He can't return before that. And there's really no reason for him to delay after that. But we have in Romans chapter 11, I think, an argument that shows us that, that when the fullness is gathered in from both, the fullness of the Gentiles and then the fullness of, of the Jews, that there will be life from the dead, which uh, is often used as a term referring to resurrection. Does that make sense? Sorry it came out so muddled in. Uh, again, it's uh, tiredness and, and probably uh, not having as much time as I'd like to review what I've <laughs> written for last week's uh, study. Okay, now this, this, this basically then is going to be the last day, okay? The last day is going to be, uh, presumably, unless the Lord allows there a few days to elapse between the last you know, Jew or Gentile that's gathered in, I guess you might say the last Jew, because if the fullness of the Gentiles is gathered in and then the partial hardening is lifted from Israel, you might say that it could be that the last one who's going to be saved is a, is a Jew. It uh, doesn't, doesn't really matter, does it? Okay. But once that happens, the last day has taken place. The last day of human history. Now we have a lot, a number of people in the church that would disagree with this, but, but I believe this is what the Bible teaches. That will be the last day of human history. That means there isn't going to be the continuance of life on the earth as we know it after that day. Okay. Uh, there is a last day coming. I think we know that if you look up uh, at number 2A, when Jesus says to, um, uh, to Martha, uh, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So on the last day is the resurrection. Okay. Now the last day is the day that the Lord is going to raise and he's going to judge all men. And this is how we know, um, and we're going to look a little bit more in this next section too, that this, this is true, uh, that when this day comes, uh, it will be the day in which the Lord raises all men because he is going to raise them to judgment. And it's not going to be partial resurrections and partial judgments, but it's going to be one resurrection and one judgment. We're going to look at the judgment next time, but we are going to see this morning there is one resurrection and there's only one judgment. Okay. If you look at Acts 17, 30 through 31, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now I want you to notice that um, uh, at least here we have the fact that the Lord is going to, uh, uh, he has fixed a day in which he is going to judge all men. And we're going to see in just a moment that that um, that day is going to be the day of, of uh, resurrection. So there is a final day coming. It's going to be the last day. We've seen in the, in the previous verse that on that day the dead are all going to rise again. As Martha says, I know that my brother is going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. That is the day in which the Lord has appointed that he's going to judge. Notice not just certain groups within the, the whole uh, uh, human race that's lived up to this point, but he's going to judge the world. He's going to judge everyone. 
okay, through one man whom he has appointed. And that man, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this addresses not only the fact that the dead are going to be raised, but it also gives us some indication of what's going to happen to them. Um, now, uh, we, we actually we're going to get into that in the next section, what's going to happen to their, their bodies. But uh, what's going to happen to the bodies of the dead saints on uh, that day? Okay, we, we know that we've looked at the intermediate state. We know that when we die, our body's going to go into the ground and our soul's going to be with the Lord if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now on the day of resurrection, what, what actually is going to happen to the saints or the bodies of the dead saints on that day? Well, I think obviously they're going to be raised from the dead. And I was thinking about um, you know, this question, uh, are these bodies going to raise, as it were, without souls and then meet souls as they're coming down from heaven? Um, or basically is the soul going to re-enter the body as it's raised from the dead and the saints will be, even though they've been with the Lord as far as their immaterial part, their soul, is it, is it going to be then suddenly in that body ascending uh, to meet the Lord in the air? I think it's probably, I think that's probably the case rather than souls and bodies sort of colliding in midair and, and uh, suddenly being uh, reunited. But there is going to be this resurrection and again reading the same passage we just read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So those bodies are going to be raised. Now what is the relationship between the body that is raised with the body that was buried? According to, first of all, the Westminster Confession. It's going to be the same. How do we know that it's going to be the same body? The Westminster Confession says it, right? But uh, what do we have in the scripture that uh, tells us that that's actually what's going to happen? Well, first of all, what about Christ? Was the body that was buried the same body that was raised? Is there anything significant about that? Okay. Well, Luke 24, 36 through 40, first of all, let's see that, that Christ was raised in the same body in which he was buried. While they were telling uh, these things, he himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now why, why did he show them his hands and his feet? They think, why would they recognize his hands and feet? I mean, if, if you wanted to demonstrate to somebody that it was you, if you had been raised from the dead, would you show them your hands and feet? <laughs> we say, look at my face, you know. So what was the, what was the thing that he was showing them? Okay, the nail holes, right? I mean, he, he's saying, this, this is me. I mean, you saw me suffer on the cross. Look, look at the nail holes, you know. And, of course, when Thomas, when Thomas, uh, who's known as in history now as Doubting Thomas, although he didn't doubt after he saw Jesus raised from the dead, he says, stick your fingers in the nail holes and thrust your hand into my side. Remember, the spear was thrust into his side and the water and the, the blood came out. That it is, it is I, you know. Uh, uh, so don't doubt any longer, okay. So he pointed these things because it was the same body. Now why is it significant that he was raised in the same body in which he was uh, buried, or he lived in, the one that was buried? Why does it matter that it was the same one? Now, you, you've heard perhaps um, some culty groups will deny the fact that uh, Jesus' body raised from the dead. What, what do the Jehovah's Witnesses teach about the body, his body? What happened to it? Why was the, why was the tomb empty? Well, in, in the case of the, you know, there, certainly uh, uh, secularism and those that, that deny supernaturalism would say that the disciples stole the body. And that's certainly uh, one of the things that, that uh, in, at least in one group, people group, that said. Tom? Huh? Okay. Uh, of course, in the light of what we just read, we'll, what would we say about that? You know, touch me and see. You know, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. You see that I have. They do believe that the body was gone, that it turned into gas, 
and disappeared, you know, flowed out, invisible. But to them it isn't important at all that Jesus, uh, that his body was raised from the dead. Why is it important to us that his body be raised from the dead? Well, that was the body in which he bore sins, and if that body isn't risen from the dead, then it's still, there's no evidence that the price was fully paid for sin. Okay. He received a, a substitute body to come alive in. That's true. The evidence wouldn't be there that the price had been paid. Okay, that's that's very important. Are there any other reasons why it was important that, that his body be raised? Maybe we should ask ourselves the question, what did he come to do? Well, he also had to open the way into heaven for humanity. For humanity. And uh, what, what part of humanity? Every part. Every part, you see. Uh, Christ did rec come to redeem us, and he didn't come just to redeem our souls, right? He came to redeem our bodies. Sometimes we think of uh, the body in the, in the way the Greeks did, you know, that the body is the prison house of the soul. It's the material evil part of us, and it's sort of a cloak or a garment we want to throw aside so we can enjoy, you know, spiritual life and so forth. But we need to realize the Lord does not intend to cast our body aside. It's a part of us. It's a part of our humanity. And Christ came to redeem the whole man and not just the soul, right? So Jesus... Uh, the fact that his body was redeemed, I mean, that was a part of his humanity. He redeemed the whole man. His, his body was raised, as well as, of course, um, his, well, his soul didn't have to be raised because it was with the Lord. But uh, the significance of the resurrection of the body is that that is the redemption of the body. Remember, the body is buried, but in light of the resurrection, which is the redemption of that aspect of us. It has, it's been redeemed in principle, but it hasn't actually been... Uh, well, I would say communicated to the body. The body hasn't actually entered into that yet, and I think all the cemeteries around us uh, prove that point. But when we die, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead, Tom. What kept him from sinking into the ground? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we, we know that if, even if he came as a spirit, I mean, he, he came in pre-incarnate form as well, and he didn't sink into the ground, with it, uh, although he could have if he wanted to, if he chose to. But the fact that he has a material body doesn't mean he can't go through the wall if he wants to, or doesn't mean he can't just appear where he wants to. I mean, he can do whatever he wants to do. You know, it's just, it's just simply be miraculous, like any of the other miracles. But yeah, they, they deny it for a variety of reasons, but I think it's clear from the scriptures that uh, he was there in the flesh, flesh and bones, you know, and so forth. And he wasn't just a spirit, and, and that was his body. And it's important that the body be raised, okay? And I think it's, it's clear from uh, these other passages of Scripture that the saints were looking forward to exactly the same thing. Look at what Job says in Job 19, verses 25 through 27. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold and whom my eyes will see, my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. Do you think that Job was, was considering or contemplating the fact that his body was going to be raised and that he was going to see the Redeemer from, that, from his flesh, from his, with his own eyes? Even after it has, has been destroyed, he knew there was going to be a death, he knew that his body was going to return to the dust, but he also understood something of the resurrection. Of course, we have the clearer light of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15. So also is the resurrection of the dead, it is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, do you think it, that uh, Paul believed that uh, the body that was actually buried is the body that's going to be raised? And, and ask yourself this question. What's being raised if it's not that body, you know? What is the Lord bringing up? New bodies from the earth, dirt, you know, dirt clods that are just suddenly being transformed into humanity that have never been human beings before? 
Um, okay. Now, again, uh, some have uh, mocked this idea, ridiculed it, saying that uh, how could God reconstitute a body that by that time is dissolved and dissipated and uh, perhaps been dispersed over the whole earth, you know, and perhaps even become a part of our bodies. You know, it's quite possible that there are molecules in our bodies that were once part of somebody else's body, right? If you happen to eat an apple from a tree where a dead person was buried next to it and their body decomposed and became fertilizer for the tree and the molecules got taken up into the tree and got deposited into the apple uh, and you ate the apple, you know. But um, again, the Lord is, is still going to raise whatever the condition of the body might be, you know. He's still going to recompose it and it's still going to be that original body even if somehow along the line some molecules were shared. Okay. All right. However, the, the confession does remind us that they are going to have different qualities. They may be the same body, but they are going to be different. Okay? They are going to be raised and glorified and, and so forth. And they're going to be resurrection bodies. They were perishable, but now they're going to be imperishable. We're given a whole series of things here. They, they were sown in dishonor. They're raised in glory. Weakness, now in power. Natural, now spiritual. And spiritual not meaning that they don't have any material substance anymore. It doesn't mean that they become spirit. But spiritual in the sense that um, now they're going to be perfectly suited for the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit as well as, of course, our soul for all eternity. So I don't think that we necessarily become immaterial once we're raised from the dead. Um, I think that we're still going to be a part of the material universe, as it were, but also we have that spiritual aspect of us, which... Again, when you get into the difference between material and immaterial, um, it can get a little bit technical and you know, somewhat strange. Uh, the question has been raised, how much space does the spirit take up? And the answer is no space. Interesting, isn't it? Because they, they say the spirit has no, uh, no um, extension in the material universe. Uh, no dimensions necessarily. The question of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. The answer that they came up with was a, a, a limitless number because um, a spirit doesn't take up any space. Whether that's true or not, it would be hard to, to say, but what they're saying is that the material, or that the, the space in which we live is um, created for material things and spiritual beings don't take up any space here. Well, we do know there's a difference one way or the other between material and spiritual. And uh, apparently our bodies, though they will be transformed, are not necessarily going to be changed uh, that that radically in the sense that they would go from material to spiritual. Now what's going to happen to the saints who are still alive on that day, that last day, the day of the resurrection? What's going to happen to them? It, it appears to be the, the case and uh, some, though, have uh, looked at that and, and wondered how to reconcile that with, with the statement that it's appointed unto man once, the, once to die, and then the judgment. Are there some that will not die? There are already some that did not die, so there is a precedent for that. Yeah. And some would, some would say, well, you know, they don't want to argue about the point and so forth. They would say, well, it's a kind of death, but not exactly the same kind of death. But it would be hard to imagine that being death, wouldn't it? Um, well, uh, of course, the, the living saints. Uh, we, yeah. But um, at least there won't be in their case what we conceive of or what we know is true in death, and that is the soul is separated from the body. Okay, that, that isn't going to happen. For those who are alive when Jesus Christ returns, there's going to be no separation of the soul from the body, but there will be a transformation. Uh, that, that body of the saints who, who did die decomposed and was recomposed and, and raised and transformed. In this case, ours is just simply going to be transformed. It doesn't have to be, you know, the, we didn't decompose, you know, so we don't have to be recomposed. Um, so anyway, there will be, though, a transformation. And uh, we'll, we'll be caught up together with the Lord in the air as well as the, the dead saints who have been raised from the dead. Okay. Uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep. And what he means by that, of course, is we'll not all die. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. 
for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So the idea is that death is abolished once and for all. No more death. What does that tell us about the continuance of human life after the last day of the resurrection? I mean, I think that even those who believe in multiple resurrections would, will admit that this passage is referring to the resurrection of the church, right? I mean, they, they quote this passage many, many times, but notice here that death is not swallowed up in victory just for them, but for all the saints, okay? Death is gone, is abolished, it's finished uh, for the church from then on, right? But, but you see, they contemplate the idea of human history continuing. Uh, well, let's see, from in, in the idea of many today, you have at least seven more years after that of tribulation, uh, divided by the three and a half years of tribulation and great tribulation, then you have a thousand years of the millennium, and you've got human beings living through that whole period of time that, that are living and dying, right? And, uh, but, but death was supposedly swallowed up in victory. What happened? Well, there's a problem there, isn't there? Uh, this appears to be an absolute swallowing up. And actually, when you consider what the Bible does teach about there being one resurrection and about that day being the end of, of human life as we understand it, then there's no, there's no mystery. There, there is nothing that continues as far as human life in the sense of as it is now after that period of time. And there's many, many other things we'll look at, but after we get past the, the, this section of the Confession, we'll, we'll delve more deeply into that. Okay, so, uh, and that's going to take place just after the dead are raised. Now, at least the dead in Christ. What happens to the unbelievers on that day? Well, I think we need to understand that um, the dead who are unbelievers are also going to be raised on that day. The dead who are still living are also going to be changed on that day. And, and can anyone tell me why we, we know that has to be the case? Why, why is it it can't be another 1,007 years? Okay. Well, we know that the resurrection is in order to a particular event and that event is judgment. And so, the idea that there's one judgment in Scripture as well, uh, which we're going to look at just briefly here in a second, also tells us that all those have to be raised. Now that, that would be an argument from what we've already, you know, just, you might say a logical argument from reason, from what we know about judgment. There's one judgment, and we know that the unrighteous are going to be judged there too, so we know they have to be raised, but we don't have to just assume that's the case. We have clear uh, scriptural revelation to that effect. If you look at John 5, 28 and 29 here. Do, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. But notice, they're all coming forth. There is an hour coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. And they're coming forth, notice, to judgment, okay, to judgment. And by the way, we, we don't want to be, we don't want to misunderstand what's being said here. Those who did the good deeds, those who committed the evil deeds, it almost sounds like this is a works-based kind of a resurrection, doesn't it? If you did good things, you'll, you'll go to the resurrection of life. If you did bad things. Now, that's true in one sense, and it's not true in another. It's not telling us that we're going to be uh, saved by doing good works. We're going to be condemned by doing evil works as though our good works merit salvation, although our evil works do merit judgment. But it's, what it's telling us is the character of those who are raised. Why is it that the saints do good deeds? Why are they characterized by this? Well, it's because Christ has changed them. It's because they have a new heart. It's, as a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards is going to point to that one thing as, as the, probably the strongest uh, evidence that we are genuine believers and that is the way we live, our actions. Okay. So Christians are characterized by 
uh, good deeds. You know, the light shines so that men may, may see our good deeds. Jesus says, let, it, let your light shine in such a way uh, because that's, um, well, that's what's true of a Christian. Christians are those that practice righteousness, John tells us. They don't practice sin. And that's something that the Lord does. That's not something we have to generate by ourselves in order to attain to this resurrection. Okay. But then let's look at the next passage, and that, that comes from um, Matthew 25, the sheep and goat judgment. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, this is the second coming, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Notice it says when the Son of Man comes, all the nations are going to be gathered before Him. Where do you think they all came from? Yeah, well, it came from resurrection because here at the, at the sheep and goat judgment we have the gathering of all who have ever lived and we have the final separation of the sheep and the goats the sheep enter into the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world the goats are cast away into eternal fire so again you have that same idea they're all gathered on that day there's a day coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth and they're coming forth to judgment and here at this judgment all the nations are gathered and here you have then that final judgment and final separation. We're going to look at the judgment more uh, next, next week, so we're not going to spend a great deal of time on that. Now, why am I laboring this point? Well, it's, it's mainly because there are those who believe in more than one resurrection. As a matter of fact, it's very common today to believe in more than one resurrection. And how many resurrections are believed uh, today by those in broad evangelicalism and what we call dispensational circles? Um, I'm, I'm sure, sure it's, it's difficult to count how many there are. As a matter of fact, I may have even come up with more than, than what I've heard them say as I, as I think about you know, what, uh, yeah, how their scheme works. And we'll look at that more later, but let me just, not when we're done with the Westminster Confession, when we get into the eschatology and so forth. But they do believe that the first resurrection... Um, you know what, there was actually another resurrection. Uh, there, there was another resurrection prior to the one that we're talking about here. It was sort of a foreshadowing. Um, and that was the one when, when Christ died, the, the veil was rent, and the saints, uh, the bodies of the saints were raised, and they went into the, into the city. Um, uh, you know what, I, I recently read something about that now that might have changed my mind on this, but I, I, I believe there, there's a question of, of what exactly happened to those saints did they go up to heaven with, with Christ uh, or did they just simply die and were they buried again? I forget, um, I think I read something that indicated they, that something other than death may have occurred again for them because then they would have ended up dying twice, right? Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll have to look at that and come back with that. But besides that, okay, what does the broad evangelical church believe regarding the resurrection? Well, when do they believe the saints are going to be raised? At the second coming? Well, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group now the... Uh, I'm going to group... Well, we're talking now about uh, dispensational uh, believers. Okay, dispensational churches. Okay. When, when do they believe that uh, the church is going to be raised? Well, I'm, not at different times, but uh, I, I've, just, I've selected a particular group of, of people. Now the church, and, and we would say, well, well you know, what do you mean by that? Because we understand the church in one sense, they understand it in another. Jan? Okay, and when does the rapture take place? Is that at the second coming? Okay. Uh, Donna? Okay. So there. Okay. The the a time is coming. She is saying where the where the church is is going to be largely missing, and uh, the Lord's going to turn to. 
the, the Jews again and deal with them in the tribulation period and of course the millennium is for, for whom? For the Jews, so where's the church you know, in, in this regard? But rather than being after all that, it's actually before all that. That's why the church isn't, isn't there. So since they believe the church isn't going to go through the tribulation, they, they believe in what's called a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? And that rapture is where Jesus comes down. That's what, what uh, they believe is referred to in the First Thessalonians 4 passage, where the Lord shall descend with a shout and the, and the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and so forth. And, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds. Now, I've just represented that to you as the second coming, because that's what it is. <laughs> but um, they don't see that as the second coming. They see that as a partial coming where he comes down and he raises up the church and removes the church from the world and then goes back to heaven. Okay, but that leaves human history continuing. And only the church has been removed because now the tribulation begins. Now the Lord turns to the Jews. But during the tribulation period, some Jews are going to die. Okay, and some Gentiles are going to die. And uh, there were Jews that died prior... Uh, by the way, uh, they don't include the Jews in that church group that was raised. The saints, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though their souls may be with the Lord, their bodies are still in the ground, and when he comes to resurrect his church at that rapture, he leaves them there, okay? He leaves them in the ground because they're going to be raised for their millennium, okay? So actually, when you get to the millennium, which is the sheep and goat judgment, just after the sheep and goat judgment, because they don't believe the sheep and goat judgment has any resurrected people in it at all. But these are the living nations that survive through the tribulation period, and they're judged and some would say, and perhaps many, that they're judged on their works as to whether or not they're considered to be worthy to go into the millennium. So that's all the living people. Okay, but then as you move into the millennium, this was for the Jews. This is what was promised for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the faithful Jews that lived up until uh, the church age, which is when Jesus came and, and uh, began his work and the Jews rejected him. Then God sets up his church. And those are all the people then that lived and that died that were resurrected at the rapture as well as those that were still alive and then those that lived prior to Christ and died. All of those are going to be brought to life in another resurrection just after the sheep and goat judgment to go into the millennial kingdom. Now I included here, so that would be pre-church and they even believe that there are Jews who were saved by being faithful to the Jewish religion as over against the Christian religion during the church age. In other words, there, there's more than one way of salvation. And there have been those who have taught that. So, the faithful Jews during the church age. And then, the, those that, li that, that perhaps died during the uh, tribulation period, uh, who were faithful Jews, they're, they're raised. So, you have all the Jews raised all the way up from, from the very beginning. Wait a minute, now we have to figure out what to do before the Jews came. Uh, because there were some <laughs> people that were faithful back then. I'm not sure if those were actually addressed. Where were they fit? I'm thinking of Noah, Adam, you know, other saints and so forth that weren't Jews. Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Where would they fit? I'm not sure if those were actually talked about. Okay. Well, so we're, we're not necessarily talking about all the ones that went all the way back in history to just before the millennial period Anyway, all the, all the saints that weren't raised before, I assume before were raised, but now I'm wondering about these others. I'm not sure exactly where they fit. Because they're not in the church and they're not Jews. In, their, in dispensational thinking. Okay, so, but then you have the millennium, and you have people who live and die during that time. And some, some are, well, see, would any of the faithful die during that time? Maybe they don't. Maybe they believe that uh, all the faithful live all the way through that time frame, even though there are people who aren't converted and they're going to be judged at the end because I was thinking that there might be a resurrection here of those Jews and Gentiles who die in the millennium but now I'm wondering whether they believe they can die in the millennium uh, but we, they certainly believe in a resurrection of the wicked at the end of the millennium that's when all the wicked of all ages are going to be raised Okay, for the, the great white throne judgment I believe they believe that there were no there were no righteous or no righteous people that, at the great white throne. We have to do a little bit of review here because that was my understanding. No righteous at the great white throne judgment. But what about all these people who lived, maybe who didn't die during the millennium? Where is their judgment? Because there's people that are born during that time frame. 
those look to me like really large holes, so I'm, when we get into it more deeply, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that I understand where they're at on that subject and see how they can possibly uh, fix those what appear to be contradictions. Okay, but the idea is at least they believe in several resurrections, but the Bible really teaches only one resurrection. And that's going to be when all the dead are raised, all the living are changed, all are gathered together for judgment. Okay. Is that, is that point at least clear? Oh, uh, Greg? Just as a general principle of biblical interpretation, if you have something that is hideously complex and you're always having to shoehorn things in and indulge in all kinds of special pleading, on the one hand, when you have something that's beautifully simple and elegant, on the other hand, you would normally choose the simple and the elegant over what often turns out to be man-made. Yes, um, that, that would be a, a testimony to the fact that we, in our weak thinking as, as sinful human beings, that we can really muddle things up when they can be quite simple. And There may be some things difficult to understand in Scripture, and we don't want to uh, deprecate that, but in this case we don't have to get so, so difficult. And, and Tom? You're talking about the thousand years, the literal yeah, the dispensational view. And so they go into the 1,000 year millennial period, and there are going to be some saved Gentiles and some saved uh, Jews. Okay, so uh, the thing that I don't understand how they can believe is that when the Jews are saved, they're going to see that they were wrong in their time about sacrificial, uh, sacrificing animals, uh, that that's the secret. Well, they could start. Yeah. The dispensationalists do have an answer for, for that. What they say is that, that they're going to be, they are going to resurrect their, their ceremonial system and they are going to sacrifice animals, but those, those sacrifices are only going to be memorial, memorial sacrifices of the sacrifice of what, you know? Of Christ, you know? So that doesn't, uh, I mean, it's like returning to the Old Testament shadows to picture Christ, I mean, that, that, uh, that is, well, they, they believe though that's what the Bible teaches, so they have to come to grips with, with how can that, how can they, how can that be fulfilled, and yet how can they still do it and, and be, you know, uh, pleasing to the Lord? Uh, so they say that they're memorial sacrifices, but it's funny that there's certain things that, that I mean, we've gone through this before uh, a while ago, went through it with some detail, but now I'm seeing things that, that just appear to be even larger holes than I saw before. It, but, uh, yeah. but, but see, the thing is now, all the Jews and Gentiles that come into the millennium are basically, in their estimation, saved. But they're going to be having children, and those children may or may not be saved. So that's why you have, at the end of the millennium, a majority of the people who are still alive during that time frame are basically going to be unconverted because there's going to be a great host as Satan is released, remember, at the end of the thousand years, and he sent to deceive the nations, and they all gather around the camp of the saints, which is relatively small, and then fire comes down from heaven, and there you have another problem, because um, is that the second coming presumably took place at the end of the tribulation period, but now you have another coming of Christ in judgment, you see, so you've actually at that point multiplied the second coming by three, at the, tribula or at the rapture, and then at the end of the tribulation period, and then at the end of the millennium, you have three second comings, you, you have several judgments, by the way, uh, and we'll look at that in just a second, and you have several resurrections. So, uh, Jay Adams actually talked about this in his book, The Time is at Hand, and he talked about, I think, I don't know if he called it double vision, I think we'd have to call it triple or quadruple vision in, in some of these cases, because they're multiplied, multiplied, multiplied by different factors, when actually there's only one resurrection, there's one judgment, um, one second coming. That's why uh, Bob Strimple, uh, in his uh, class on the Holy Spirit, which also dealt with eschatology, he called it strim strimplified, 
<laughs> eschatology, which was a play on words, simplified eschatology. It's really quite simple. But because the dispensationalists want to maintain a distinction between two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, and different futures for them, and a difference between the church and, and Israel, rather than seeing that as the, as the you know, old covenant people and the new covenant people, and you know, having continuity there, they want to make a division, and as they divide things, they have to multiply these other things in order to make sense out of uh, uh, their, their distinction, which is false to begin with. So it's a faulty beginning point, and it ends in, in that, that kind of difficulty. Well, let's uh, move on to the next section. I think we can cover this fairly uh, quickly. In section three, basically what's going to happen to the bodies of the wicked and the righteous of the resurrection? Um, 32.3, the bodies of the unjust shall by the power of Christ be raised to dishonor. The bodies of the just by his spirit unto honor and be made conformable to his own glorious body. So first of all, what will happen to the bodies of the wicked at the resurrection? We've already seen that they're going to be raised at the same time as the righteous generally. The dead in Christ rise before the living saints are translated, but all the dead are probably raised at the same time. Um, I already talked about the fact dispensationalism teaches they're going to be raised at the end of the millennium, but um, we've already read in John chapter 5 that they're raised at the same time that the saints are raised. Now, I also mentioned they believe that all the unconverted are going to be raised and judged at the great white throne judgment. That's one judgment they believe that takes place at the end of the millennium. Uh, in their estimation, the, the literal earthly millennium that takes place after the tribulation period, which is primarily for the Jews. And they hold that judgment to be distinct from what's called the Bema Seat Judgment and the Sheep and Goat Judgment. The, the Bema Seat Judgment is the only one I haven't mentioned yet. And they believe that's another judgment. So here's three judgments. I already talked about the fact of several judgments, right, in, in their estimation. Okay. Well, we, don't, we all know what the Great White Throne Judgment is, the one spoken of in Revelation 20. It takes place at the end of the millennium. Um, after the, you know, Christ returns on his third time and uh, destroys the, the wicked and saves the saints and so forth, and there's a great white throne judgment. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before you know, the judgment seat, and the books were open, and they were judged according to the, what was there. Well, they believe that's a resurrection just, and a judgment just for the wicked. Uh, the Bema Seat judgment is the one in 2 Corinthians 5.10 where it says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we've done in our bodies, whether good or evil. Okay. They believe that to be a separate judgment than the sheep and goat judgment because that's just for the living nations at the end of the tribulation period. The, the great white throne judgment is just for the wicked at the end of the millennium period, millennial period. The Bema Seat judgment is for the church or for the saints that are a part of the church. And, and that basically is, uh, is basically perfunctory because everybody at that judgment is going to enter into heaven. So it's just for the righteous. There's no wicked cast away at that particular because there's no wicked present. And the only thing we're judged uh, on are our works and the, basically the level of reward that we get there. But, again, strimplified eschatology, if you want to call it that, or we'll call what we call biblical eschatology, says there's only one judgment. And that the great white throne judgment, the sheep and goat judgment, the bema seat judgment, they are all the same judgment. There's no difference between them. And, as a matter of fact, it does take place at the end of the millennium. But the millennium takes place at a different time than, uh, than what the dispensationalists believe. And it actually takes place before Christ comes, rather than after he comes. And we'll get into that later. Okay. And I've already mentioned here, it's clear from Scripture there's only one resurrection followed by one judgment. I think we've already looked at this. Uh, we already read the John 5 passage, all who are in the tombs, there's an hour coming, all are going to hear his voice, and so forth. Acts 24, 14 through 15. Paul talking before the Jews saying, But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now how would you read that? A resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. Well, there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous, there's going to be a resurrection of the wicked, you know, is that what he's talking about? Well, that's how they have to read it, but it is a resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. Okay. Okay, at that time, the bodies of the wicked are going to be raised to dishonor, and I, all I want to say here is that, um, saying something that Jonathan Edwards said, we have to realize that 
When we look at the bodies of the saints in just a moment, and we've already seen something about what happens to them. They're perishable, now imperishable, dishonor, now glory, and natural, now spiritual. That there is a very positive change that takes place in the bodies of the saints, something that's very good. Now, would we assume the same thing is going to happen in the case of the wicked? Their bodies are going to be raised too. Are they going to be transformed into this glorious, you know, uh, spiritual body? No. But they are going to be raised. So what kind of body are they going to have? Well, you know, the, the Bible isn't, isn't specific on exactly what it's like. We do know that they are raised to dishonor. And we know that from the uh, passage in Romans 2, 4 through 11. Um, Actually, I think we know that from the First Corinthians 15 passage, but I don't think I quoted it here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, here. Oh, I did quote it here. It's actually in the next section down. Or, wait a minute. No, I didn't. I don't have it here. Okay, anyway. Uh, the idea is they're not going to be raised and, and, and have the, these different changes taking place to their bodies. So what kind of bodies are they going to have? Well, as Jonathan Edwards surmises, uh, God does things in a very reasonable fashion. And as he fits the saints to an eternity of blessedness and glory in heaven and gives them bodies appropriate to that, he's going to give the wicked bodies that are suitable and appropriate to what they're going to be doing for the rest of eternity, which is suffering. So he would say that uh, as saints would look forward to their resurrection bodies and I suppose if you could sort of stand outside of it and look at it you say oh that's great I, I can't wait to get into that kind of thing you know to put that on Th that the wicked if they could look at theirs you know they're, they're dreading the, the, the body that they would they would actually inhabit because of its character but also because when they put it on their suffering is going to multiply by new dimensions and I think we've already talked about that because in the intermediate state, when the wicked are being punished, it's only their souls that are being punished, right? Their souls are, are suffering, as in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. That was just his soul that they were referring to, that was in the flames, and he's tormented in the flames. And even though he talks about it as though he has a tongue and so forth, although, you know, I suppose one could argue that was looking ahead at that particular point, because it does say, can he cool, cool my tongue? He doesn't actually have a physical tongue, does he? So maybe in that case, it either is talking about the future or it's representing the kind of suffering that even his soul is undergoing at that time. And certainly Christ does represent the intermediate state as a time when, when the wicked are suffering. But they're suffering only spiritually, we might say, because all they have is a soul to suffer with. But now they're going to have a body that can suffer as well, that's going to be reunited to the soul and cast whole into what the Bible calls the lake of fire, which uh, doesn't sound pleasant. And their suffering is going to be multiplied because it's not going to be just a spiritual kind of suffering now, but it's going to be spiritual and physical. Nerve endings, apparently, that, that experience pain. It's going to be a new kind of, of uh, experience for them. So not, not pleasant. Okay. Anyway, this passage in Romans chapter 2 basically talks about how the wicked are, are storing up wrath for themselves in the day of God's wrath. Let me, let me just go ahead and read it. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So again, the idea here is that they are going to suffer. Uh, Wrath and indignation is going to be what, what they inherit or what they receive on that day and bodies that will be suitable to that. Now what, on a more positive note, what's going to happen to the bodies of the righteous? They will be raised to honor. And we've already talked about that in 1 Corinthians 15 and, and Romans chapter 2. Their bodies are going to be made like Christ, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory uh, by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. So there's what's going to happen to the saints on that day. What is this body going to be like that uh, Paul told us about in 1 Corinthians 15? It's going to be like the body of Christ who is going to transform us into the, uh, basically into conformity with His body, uh, the body of His glory. And these bodies I've already mentioned will be perfectly suited for an eternity of blessing. Um, one thing I, I, I put here that isn't altogether correct because I was thinking only of the body at the time. They will continue to be material and spiritual beings, body and soul, but their bodies will be completely filled with the Holy Spirit, the love and blessedness of God. Now that statement is true, but we have to include the soul as well. I mean, the soul is the dwelling place of the Spirit, but the Spirit is going to inhabit the body as well. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, But we do want to include our souls there. That's the most important part. He's united to our souls and, and will fill us with His divine presence and, and his, his fruits and His nature. And that's what's going to uh, perfectly suit us to live in, in that environment. Uh, and to enjoy it to the utmost. And he is going to be our blessedness, our joy, our pleasure. Uh, everything that we read about as far as religious affections that are going to be there in their, their absolute uh, strongest uh, uh, degree comes about because we're going to have more of the Spirit's work and presence in our lives. So uh, even though we are talking just about the bodies here um, uh, and, and realizing too that once in the intermediate state when our soul goes to be with the Lord in heaven it is inhabited by the Spirit who is still united to that soul which makes heaven heaven for the saint and gives us the ability to fully enjoy heaven in the way that um, you know, we would hope that we would enjoy heaven just being so filled up and enraptured with the Lord's presence and glory. Uh, but our bodies are also going to join that at some point. Uh, in the new heavens and the new earth when the Lord says, uh, you know, come and inherit the kingdom which was prepared for you, it is going to be a different place. Um, we were in heaven up to that point, but at that point heaven and earth basically become one after the judgment and uh, we will enter into a, a, a transformed heaven and earth, the new heavens and earth and uh, the tabernacle of God is now among his people and he will dwell among his people and so it's going to be on this transformed earth that the Lord is going to dwell and his people are going to dwell with him so we'd say the location's a bit different although much better you know it's going to be nice in both cases but this is going to be better because even as the saints or excuse me the, the wicked's judgment is going to be multiplied, the saint's pleasure is going to be multiplied. Now we have a body to enjoy it as well as a soul. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's the resurrection. Next week we're going to look at the judgment. And maybe by that time we'll be able to um, rethink a little bit of, that, of the dispensational view on that because they do divide the judgments up. Okay, any questions on that? We're a little bit over time. We should there's no, no uh, burning questions, then uh, we'll go ahead and close with prayer. And if you have any questions that occur to you, uh, we can deal with those next week. Let's, let's have a word of prayer.